Well, they certainly haven't diminished the role, and I think, I think this organization itself, uh, the history of political consultants, altered somewhat the playing field of campaigns. Uh, when I started campaigns in the 60s, party organizations still were in play, and you had numerous volunteer organizations. Uh, I grew up in California, places like Orange County and others had, had tremendous organizations. But as campaigns became more and more sophisticated, the early campaigns were putting up yard signs, a few mail pieces, uh, a candidate going out and doing sort of town hall type stuff and raising a little bit of money. But all of a sudden, as they became extremely sophisticated, television, radio, uh, beyond the billboards, always was one billboard in every campaign, right near the candidate so he could see it driving back and forth. He knew he was in a real campaign <laughs> if he could see his billboard. Uh, <laughs> And you could also do the other, drive the opponent by putting something crazy there. But as the campaigns became very sophisticated and, and, and this industry built up because you're spending, you know, now millions and millions of dollars, you need someone who understands the game so well. Uh, at the end of the day, there wasn't quite the need for volunteers. There wasn't quite the need uh, for local parties. And I think to a certain extent, uh, Democrats maintained it somewhat by having the environmental groups and the labor unions and what have you on our side. You know, we had various groups, uh, NRA, others that were involved in certain things, but they weren't, they weren't per, per se partisan. What I think's happened now is that voters today uh, are concerned, and, they, and the Tea Party is the epitome of the example. Uh, the Perot movement was a perfect example. Uh, Ross Perot, uh, the very longest period of my life was the six weeks I ran <laughs> Ross Perot's campaign, <laughs> in which I took him from 39 to 16 in that period of time. <laughs> with a major, major assist from Ross. But the, but the extraordinary thing there, and I walked in one day, I said, where are all these, you know, and they were calling into 1-800. They had four million people who had called into the 1-800 uh, number volunteering to do something, to give money, to do whatever. So I said to him, the first day I was there, well, where are all those people? Well, they punched them in the cards and then locked them up in a safe. They had never communicated with them. And I walked in and I said, we've got to mail these people. We have to uh, you know, communicate with them. And, and of course, he didn't want to do it. The difference in this movement as opposed to that is this movement is not a leader, is not led by anyone. It's leaderless. Right. Uh, and so it, it, it's, uh, it can stay alive. Perot became so disillusioning to the people who wanted to change that the movement quickly went away. But I would argue that the hardest part of the business today, and I use the example, I ran uh, Edelman in New York and I basically, uh, my office was in Times Square, and every day I'd walk into Times Square, and you'd look up at those gigantic billboards, and these billboards are five, ten million dollars. You could put one of these in Des Moines, Iowa, and people would drive from 30 miles to watch them. <laughs> but there's, there's such a clutter, and no, no, nothing derogatory about Des Moines. We love Iowa. We'll be see you again soon. <laughs> uh, there's such a clutter there. And so in order to break out, which is what the business we're all in today, I think you have to still be as consistent in your message, and the danger that sometimes happens, and I say this to, to all of you, is when you have so many ways of communicating, you've got to make sure the story is still being told over and over and over again in, in each vehicle. What happens is you send out 150 pieces of mail all targeted, and you forget the overarching theme. And I think we saw that in a couple campaigns this time. Uh, uh, Linda McMahon in, in uh, uh, Connecticut uh, you know, spent $59 million. She might not have won in Connecticut, but her message was all over the place. Uh, Whitman in California has been $150 million. Uh, you know, there, there are so, so many pieces of mail, the mail itself became an, an issue because people said, My, I'm just being bombarded. When I learned mail in California, the, the, the trick was you had from the mailbox to the garbage can to get your message told. Uh, and the assumption was they were never going to open it. The assumption was they were never going to read it. So you had to basically get that message in there real quick, uh, or the image. And I would argue today that, uh, in going to, to the cultural issues, uh, people are frustrated. They, they don't think, and I'm not sure all this chaos that's going on in Wisconsin or Washington or any place else uh, is, is the end result. I think, I think it's, 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 it's part of the, the sophistication of voters today who say, listen, I'm tired of it. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to be there. Uh, my sense is this is going to be a very dynamic election, in spite of the fact the media has already re-elected Obama. Uh, I think we'll end up with a very good nominee. I think we have some very sophisticated governors running. And the process of the, of the, of the you know, you can take someone like Palin overnight and she has a 94% name ID. You can basically, in the course of doing 30 or 40 or 50 debates, which you will, a Mike Huckabee can come from a 1% name ID to win in Iowa. 
So I think if you basically can stay on message and drive your message effectively, uh, you have an ability today to move people as effectively as you ever have in the past. Right, I would, uh, if I could, Paul, just, just add that the, the, the folks in this room have a special opportunity coming up because for the, for the last 30 years, we've had to figure out how mail works, how telephone works, how television works and print and so forth and in in, in try to integrate it as much as possible. But now, uh, beginning, uh, beginning in the last year, the, 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 the mobile uh, device, which is the most intimate and always with you electronic device we're gonna have for probably a generation in some form or another, carries with it the potential to raise money to carry a voter registration list, to, to get your morning uh, news fix from the campaign or from wherever, and don't, don't underestimate uh, the, uh, the power of this thing. It now outnumbers personal computers three to one in the United States, and it's, it's spreading among all demographics. So take the time to learn about uh, how to use the applications and even how to give your key workers a phone if you need to. I'm just gonna add, uh, Paul, to come back to your question in terms of citizen activism. Uh, uh, Ed was talking about uh, movements and, and commitments, and the truth is, Movements require commitments, and commitments require time. And one of the things that people have much right. less of today than they did in the 60s is time. Um, obviously, women in the workforce uh, in a way that they weren't then. And you, know, you look at places like Egypt and Libya, right. women playing a very su substantial role in part because there's time there. Students had time. Uh, and you know, when, when in the 60s and 70s, uh, students, consciously or not, came to, while they were in school, felt that whatever they did with their time, they were gonna have a job at the end of the day. Today, most students are worried, spending every minute of their waking hours trying to prepare themselves to be able to get that job that may not be there. And so the time for activism is much more limited. And just in general, as people are working more and more hours, uh, uh, men, women, uh, others, to, to uh, children even, to working more and more hours to support the family, much less time available to engage in those kinds of uh, political and social activities that drive movements. I think that's true, but I think that uh, Roger made a point that's, that's very important. Uh, not only have we had these waves, but people get involved when they get very frustrated, excited, angry, uh, and it, it, I've always been amazed at, uh, uh, that, that when, when critics of the political system say, well, not everybody's involved. Well, when everybody's involved, you have Libya or you, right, <laughs> you, yeah, you have yeah. Egypt. Right, right, right. And yeah. when they're that upset, when you get 100% of the people really angry, things don't go well. Yeah, and you'll uh, pre appreciate this since you're going to be the, uh, the next president of the, of the NRA. Uh, people today talk about, you know, our discourse is uh, too edgy and so forth. Well, I think the best piece of copy I ever wrote was an envelope that said, enclosed, your chance to tell the NRA to go to hell. <laughs> and uh, that- We uh, didn't go. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you sure didn't, you sure didn't. But it, it sure mobilized folks right. on, on our side to pass the Brady Bill, so. Well, I think one yeah. thing that's happened that, uh, <coughs> is that where, where you say that a lot of people say they're less involved, while obviously a lot of other people are more involved, is that it is true that from the sort of the 60s on, politics became sort of a spectator sport. Right. Uh, you had great involvement in the Goldwater campaign, the McGovern campaign, the Reagan campaign, but particularly after Reagan, we went into a period when many of us were partly responsible for. Volunteers are the most expensive part of any campaign, as we know, and, and, uh, and we went into a period, and Paul Laxalt was very upset about this, at the, when he was at the Republican National Committee, where where everybody, they didn't lock the volunteers in a vault like Ross Perot, what they did do is ignore them right. because they thought it was much more effective to move numbers with media and that and, and, and politics became even more of a spectator sport. And now we're in a wave where the frustration and the anger has built up and people are coming, are coming back. And actually, if, uh, if you were to give uh, uh, Obama credit for anything, which, and I don't give him credit for a lot, uh, but uh, was that his campaign brought people back in using technology and all that, but they were also on the left uh, and in the, among independents expressing frustration. Now you've got, the, the, the initial message of the Tea Party, there were two things, which goes back to all these other waves. One, they're concerned about the, the substance of the, of the economic issue, but if you, if you listen to them, they said, nobody listens to us. 
And that is the common theme of all of these sort of grassroots uprisings over time. Uh, and, and, but it's, it's the issues. It's one of the reasons that the National Rifle Association has been the most successful uh, and longest lived advocacy group in American history. It's because the people who are involved, and there are a lot of them, which helps, really care about that issue. Uh, and in today's politics, that's what matters. The, 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 uh, you know, when you were in college in the 60s and 70s, the political scientists all had this ideal of the American voter who weighed all these issues and stuff and then made a rational decision. I've never met that guy. Because uh, right. if, you, if, you, if you badgered your professor, you found out that he voted on one issue. <laughs> and, you know, and, the, and the point of a political campaign <laughs> or a political movement is to build a coalition of enough people that believe in one or two issues that they come together and form a majority. Uh, but it's those issues, ultimately, that get them upset. Uh, I want to add one thing, you know, because uh, David Broder died this week, and he, and he really chronicled those first waves of change. He wrote a book in the 70s, The Party's Over, uh, which, uh, which chronicled the demise of the parties and the selection of candidates uh, and, the, and, and, and the rise and change of things. And we've gone through several waves. The parties now are just sort of there. Uh, and in our party, we had a chairman who couldn't raise money, couldn't do anything, and it didn't much matter because other people picked right. it up. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the power centers have moved, and because of the technology, they moved away from the parties, they moved to the candidates, and now they've moved away from the candidates to, the, to, to, to these people. They may not have much time, but it doesn't take much time in the, in the modern world to organize. Right. See, the interesting right. thing, when we all sort of came of age, the possible exception of, of Mark, the Vietnam War was the critical dividing issue. And I still find Democrats who, st that was the greatest experience they ever had. You know, University of Wisconsin, Columbia, whatever, and that's, that sort of set the tone for your party for a long, long period of time. Uh, and many conservatives come out of that just with the opposite points of view. I've been astonished, and it mattered, it did matter, because there were kids being killed and it was a war that obviously, uh, uh, without end. And we've been in two wars now for a very long period of time, and it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind, professional military as opposed to volunteer military. But I've been amazed that the Democrat Party uh, has allowed, with a president who ran as the peace candidate, uh, uh, to be in the second year of his term, uh, and probably be in the, throughout this term, will still have soldiers in Afghanistan and elsewhere. I think the Tea Party will remain, and, and it's good for the Republican Party, because it's made us a fiscal party again. Uh, we had lost our way. We wanted to do everything Democrats did for 80% of the cost. Uh, and when we, got, when we got the chairmanships, our, you know, our subcommittees on appropriations and what have you, they all love running around being Mr. Chairman. And the way you're Mr. Chairman is you dole out the money. And we had lost our way. And I think these people are gonna make us hold our feet to the fire and you know, we may go up or we may go down. Uh, we may have a, a re get thrown out of office in Wisconsin or what have you, but we're gonna be true to what we said we would be, which makes elections matter. Uh, uh, Dave uh, Keen mentioned David Broder, uh, uh, who died yesterday. Uh, in the obit in the, uh, the Washington Post uh, this morning, and, uh, or yesterday online, if you read it, uh, uh, was this sentence. The plain-spoken Mr. Broder disliked the influence of political consultants on Washington journalism and their desire to control how news is spun. Um, I, don't, I don't know that David Broder disliked political consultants because he didn't dislike very many people, and I suspect that Ray Strother and others in this room probably had many conversations with, with David Broder over the years and probably people on this, on this stage as well. Uh, but, it, but it does raise the question, again, uh, uh, posed by Roger, uh, on the state of the craft, and specifically whether the proliferation of political consultants has benefited or harmed our democratic process. Why don't we just go start by going down the line on that? 